get in the way. Um, known to one and all, Martin Brown from Renesis to talk about internet captivity and the de-peering menace. Greetings, Nanog45. Um, the Renesis Entertainment Company proudly presents Peering Wars, episode 1239-174. So I'm Martin Brown. Uh, I'm going to walk through uh, the overview of the presentation here, and then we'll get into the content. Uh, default free zone, we're going to define a couple of things. Most people know what this is, but I'll talk a little bit about the default free zone, who's there, what it is. Deep hearing, why it's tricky, uh, why it's so problematic in the DFC. We'll clarify a bit of terminology about single homedness and uh, captivity. Uh, we'll go through a couple of uh, historical, uh, recent historical deep hearing events, uh, big ones. Um, and then we'll take a look at this particular event, this sprint cogent deep hearing on October 30th. We'll look at who was affected, uh, who, who the captives were, uh, the geographic scope, and, uh, and then to round out this concept of captivity, we're going to take a look at uh, captives inside the transit cones of all of the members of the DFC. So the default free zone, we all know what the default free zone is. It's uh, all the ASNs who, uh, who do not carry a default route, who don't have a transit provider. Um, the thing that I want to stress here is that we look at this from a routing perspective, strictly a routing perspective, not a business perspective. We don't distinguish between paid peering and unpaid peering. So. Uh, and then spats between DFZ members uh, obviously will affect uh, everybody in the transit cone of the two participants. So that's what we'll look at in a little bit more detail. Here is the default free zone as of uh, the date of the event and continues to be. Um, the players all look quite familiar, and uh, you will notice that Energy Sciences Network AS293 is in here. They do peer with everybody in the DFC. So that, that may come as a surprise, even though they're not commercially, they're, they don't, commercially carry any track. So deep hearing. Uh, deep hearing is, is uh, quite simple. Um, one peer in a relationship uh, feels that it is not reaping a uh, proportional advantage to the relationship and uh, breaks, the, breaks the peering link. So traffic ratios are a common, uh, common problem uh, when one, one provider is pushing more traffic across the peering link than the other. So uh, the aggrieved party is typically the one who is breaking the peering link. The, the effects differ uh, significantly depending on whether you're inside the DFZ or outside the DFC. So if you're, if you're outside the DFC, this is your smaller provider, you're not in that, that group of 13 we just looked at. If you're not inside that group, you, you have transit providers. So, so if there's a de-peering, you and, and uh, somebody, a former peer, you have this, this peering, de-peering, well, your traffic is going to follow your transit link and, and it's going to get to its destination. This, this isn't is this may be a big deal to you and your business, but it doesn't hurt the internet. It doesn't break the promise of, of one internet. You, you pay more for transit and, and uh, go on with life. Inside the DFC, it gets a little bit more problematic because this, this traffic between the former peers doesn't have any place to go. There is no transit link. Everybody in, this, in, this, in the DFC needs to peer with everybody else in order for this to work. So consequently, for anybody who's captive inside the transit cone of one of the DFC members, the internet becomes broken. These are the innocent bystanders. They are captives, captive customers. So this is a, this is a, a cartoon of the DFC using six members. We have a, we have a click routing mesh. Um, P, P5 and P6 are the ones uh, who are having a deep hearing disagreement, right? So, so one of them has deep the other one, and now that link is broken. If we look at this before the de-peering, we see that everybody in P1 through P6, everybody peers with everybody else. Okay? So what happens when that peering link goes away? Well, P4 has no incentive whatsoever to carry traffic from P5 to P6. There's no financial benefit. So what happens to our customers, customers underneath the cones of P6 and P5? They can't reach each other. C1 cannot talk to anybody in P5's network, let alone P5 itself. So single homedness. This is pretty clear. If an AS has one transit provider, well, it's single home. That's the case here on the, on the left. Um, we have seen in the wild cases like this where you would have uh, an AS which has more than one provider, but if you tracing up toward the DFC, well, you'll find that maybe 
those providers have a single AS in common as a provider. So we term this transitively single homed. This case on the left, the far left, uh, excuse me, on the far right is one that we'll see in a few minutes. We'll see an actual example of. So this is, this is transitively single homed. We would say in this case, um, well, well a AS1 is single homed behind AS2 if AS2 is the only provider of AS1, okay? A a AS1 is transitively single homed behind AS2 if AS1's providers are either AS2 or themselves transitively single homed behind AS2. So this extends logically to prefixes, although when we use the term single home, we're typically just talking about ASNs. So the term captive will introduce to talk about prefixes. Prefixes, uh, a prefix is suspected captive to an AS if all observed routes from all peers have in common now, this is, this is particularly relevant if we're talking about the DFC. So let's take those 13 members in the DFC. If, if we look at all routes to a given prefix, and in the uh, rightmost portion of the path, we have the same DFC provider, we see the same DFC provider for every single route, we can conclude, we can guess, that this particular prefix is captive to that ASN. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Okay, so, so differentiating a captive from a suspected captive takes something. It takes an event. A de-peering is really clear. When we have a de-peering, it's really clear. You can look and you can see who, in, if you have a, a distributed view, you have a large number of peers whose routes you're collecting, you can take a look and you can see, huh, inside that particular transit cone, there are all of the routes to prefixes uh, in the peers, the former peers transit cone, they're all withdrawn. That's clear that that prefix is captive in the, in the other provider's cone. So a de-peering shows you who actually is captive. Alternatively, if we look at all advertisements seen over time and look for any evidence of backup routes, maintenance windows, we can actually identify captives or suspected captives. So we're going to do that actually a little bit later and take a look at uh, uh, the results. So a few observations. Um, if an AS is captive, if an AS is single homed behind another AS, all of its prefixes are, by definition, captive. So how do we identify them? Well, a de-peering obviously provides proof of captivity, can provide proof of captivity. If, if there is a de-peering here in the DFZ, and, and we don't see any, any alternate routes to those prefixes, we know that prefix is captive inside the transit cone of the DFC provider. Uh, routing advertisement history, this is where we actually go through. We can actually go through and we can look for those maintenance windows. We can look for uh, routing problems. Anytime uh, we see the convergence process, when, when a withdrawal comes in, we'll see the convergence process and we can see all of the backup routes, sometimes. not all of the backup routes, but we can see backup routes. So we can get some idea if a given prefix is actually captive. So. And finally, this is, this is actually a, a kind of an interesting thing we, we've seen more and more of, and that is an ASN. Uh, uh, an outfit wants to speak BGP on the internet, and so they get themselves an ASN, and, and then they plop in a router in a location over here, and they plop, plop in a router in a location over there, and it's kind of like these little islands, right? They, they actually have one transit provider. Maybe in a given location, they'll have two transit providers. But they're these little islands from which they're advertising these prefixes. So, so it's an archipelago, and any individual prefix advertised from, from an ASN that has these little islands scattered about, any individual prefix may actually be captive. So simply because an ASN looks like it's multi-homed, it may not be for a given prefix. Okay, so a couple of real-world examples. Pfizer, single home behind, uh, Pfizer 11971, single home behind uh, 7018. Uh, this one is the example that I, I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. So we have, uh, we have an ASN, 40844. They have two providers. They have two transit providers. They have 7018 and 6389. 6389 has a sole transit provider, 7018. So this is a case where uh, this is a transitively single-homed ASN, 40844. So here's an example of, here's an example, I was just talking about islands. We've got these, these uh, ASNs which essentially have these disjoint locations where they drop in, drop in a router and 
advertise a prefix. Well, Cognizant Tech is doing this. They actually have five different providers, but uh, in one location, they have a prefix they're advertising simply through Sprint. So this prefix, this, slash, this particular slash 24, is only visible inside Sprint's cone. Therefore, we say this prefix is captive in Sprint's transit cone. So not all prefixes from this AS are captive, just this one particular prefix. So let's get on to some high-profile deep hearings from the past. Uh, we've given talks on a number of these, so I'll, I'll zip through the first two pretty quickly, and then we'll talk about the uh, we'll talk about uh, 1239, 174. Um, Cogent versus Level Three, October of 2005. The partition lasted for two days. This is kind of the biggest, uh, the first one that was very big that I think got noticed outside of uh, the sort of network operator community. That's my perception. Uh, I gladly take. Uh, uh, comments on that if people know of older deep hearing events that made it outside our community. Um, level 3 had notified Cogent a couple months in advance, and uh, these were captive prefixes. 5,100 prefixes captive inside Level 3's cone. That was about 10%, 10% of Level 3's on net, 10% of Level 3's cone. 2,300 prefixes for Cogent, about 5% of all of uh, uh, Cogent's transitive prefixes. This was 4.3% of all of the prefixes in the routing table at that time. So that means that 4.3% of all prefixes were affected and were experiencing this partitioned internet. The promise of one whole internet was broken for this 4.3% of prefixes. Cogent and Telia depearing, this is a little bit less than a year ago. Partition lasted for about two weeks. Um, most heavily affected geographic reason, regions were uh, United States, uh, served primarily by Cogent, and North Central Europe, Telia, the, no surprise here. <laughs> After this link was restored, it seems pretty clear that this was about a peering ratio dispute because Telia chose almost 3,000 more prefixes via Cogent after the event, and Cogent 600 fewer. So 1.6% of the prefixes in the global routing table this was a smaller event. 1.6% of all prefixes in the global routing table at that time were affected by this partition. So on to the main event. Cogent and Sprint depearing, October 30th, started at 20 UTC afternoon uh, for many of us in, the, in North America. Um, bef there wasn't a big change in the number of prefixes seen on the edge before and after the event. A, li a few prefixes uh, uh, fewer on the uh, advertised from Sprint to Cogent, uh, but that number did creep, creep back up a little bit. 3.3% um, of the prefixes in the global routing table were affected. So, so this was actually uh, larger, uh, closer in size and in, in effect, scope of effect to, uh, to the 2005, uh, March 2005 event. This is a time series of prefixes seen on the edge, so not a whole lot to report here. Uh, these, are, these are on eight-hour intervals, but you can see very clearly where the, where the depearing occurred, when the depearing occurred. So uh, if you take a look at that first data point, uh, 1031 at midnight, that means that in the last eight-hour window, we saw that many prefixes, so uh, 8,029 or so, um, just a little bit below 8,000 for uh, uh, the uh, 174.12.39 edge. Interesting captives, captives behind, captives inside Sprint's cone. 214 ASNs were single homed. 6,603 prefixes were captive behind Sprint, out of which 856 were, 857 were registered to some variant of Sprint's Sprint PCS, uh, Sprint's network operations. So, so uh, some of the ones that uh, uh, we pulled out that we found interesting were uh, the 246 prefixes from Sprint PCS. Uh, it seems not unlikely that the mobile customer base, that Sprint's mobile customer base was uh, one of the major drivers, at least on Sprint's side, for uh, repairing, uh, repairing the depearing. We've got some other, uh, some other candidates, the Department of the Interior, Department of Justice, uh, single-homed uh, inside Sprint's cone, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 65 different educational institutions, prefixes from 65 different educational institutions and uh, uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of commercial outfits as well. Captives behind Cogent, 289 different ASNs, uh, 2,349 prefixes captive inside Cogent's cone. Uh, NASA has, of course, a, a number of ASNs and a number of prefixes that they advertise, some of which 
were captive in Cogent's Cone. Uh, New York court system is, uh, is kind of a one that seems to show up every time in Cogent's Cone. A lot of prefixes, and, uh, and um, we've, we've mentioned them before. 63 edu educational institutions and a couple of financial outputs. So broken down by geography, uh, so both Sprint and uh, Cogent have a very heavy U.S. showing, so we actually exclude, uh, we exclude the U.S. showing from this particular graph identifying how many prefixes uh, geolocate to the U.S., um, but it's clear that Sprint has a, a, quite a, a presence in, in Latin and South America here. You can see uh, Colombia, Honduras, Mexico, Argentina, uh, Brazil, Guatemala, Uruguay. Very heavy, uh, very heavy presence in, in South America and Latin America. Cogent, strong, strong U.S., um, Canada, France. So geog geography breakdown for the prefixes affected. So who won? This is always interesting. So, of course, uh, there were about 1,426 prefixes, which were on the edge prior to the depeering, but were not captive. So who won those routes? 1,426 of Sprint's prefixes and 526 of Cogent's. The way we identify the, the winner in this case is, is by uh, seeing who, uh, who carries that prefix now, or who carried during the depeering, who carried that prefix to uh, the, the other combatant. And uh, a single prefix can actually be won by multiple providers. So what we do is we then take a look at the total percentage and we break it down by the, the percentage. So we, who won Cogent's prefixes? Uh, AboveNet came in carrying about, uh, winning about a, a third of, uh, of the prefixes. Uh, level three, Tata making a good showing. And uh, Sprint's prefixes? Tata and Global Crossing both came in at about 18%, taking about 18%. So, the peering link was restored on Sunday evening. This was four days after the, uh, after the initial, uh, after the break. Uh, Sprint uh, issued a statement at the time that the restoration was a temporary reconnection and a further re-depeering would occur unless the issue was resolved. And uh, the, issue, the issue at hand is, is a contract dispute. Uh, so I like that uh, a peace ensued in the galaxy on the 22nd of December and uh, uh, that the specifics of this agreement are confidential, which is not a surprise at all. So I want to pause for a moment here. And now I've, I've kind of covered the uh, Sprint Cogent depeering itself. And I want to talk for just a second about uh, captivity, captive prefixes in the DFC and how we went through identifying the number of captives in each transit provider's cone. And then we also counted how many prefixes relative to the on net, relative to the downstream cone size. So what we did is we took uh, over a period of 28 days, we took all prefixes seen and we looked at all, all uh, AS paths. If a prefix showed up with more than, with uh, in the rightmost DFZ member that showed up first, if there was more than one, it was not counted as a captive. So for 28 days running, all AS paths seen for a given prefix need to have a single DFC member as the rightmost DFC member in all AF AS paths. Does that make sense? I'm getting a lot of nods. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> okay. So this is the breakdown of the total number of captives in the transit cones of each of the major DFC providers. So AT&T is the big winner with about 9,539 captives inside their transit cone. These are globally routed prefixes, 9,539. That's about 5% of their, their entire transit cone. Uh, 7,417 for level three, a lot of prefixes. This was a substantiation. The uh, uh, sprint we find according to this analysis, which is actually not based on observation. This is based on, this is not based on an observation of an event. This is based on routing data, just, just routing data. So these are suspected captives. We don't necessarily know if in 28 days we'd see a backup route. But the, a substantiation of our methodology is that for Sprint, we came out with 6,627 suspected captives. That's very close to 6,603, which we actually measured during the depeering. So substantiation of our methodology. Interestingly, uh, uh, to some of us, Savis shows about 50% of the, 
of their transited cone, 50% of their cone is captive. So we, pick, we decided we'd pick a little bit on AT&T, find a couple of, their, uh, uh, find a couple of uh, examples from many different categories. This uh, sweeps across all, all industries. I mean, all of us know this, but it affects everybody. Um, so in conclusion, intelligent multi-homing is good. Um, we can see the example uh, that I gave of Winn-Dixie is not necessarily intelligent multi-homing, but how do they know that? They went out and they got two providers. But interestingly, they're actually captive. They're transitively single-homed to 7018. No single DFC provider can guarantee global connectivity. How, how, can, how can one provider do this? Can't. Another provider might pick a fight with you. Uh, Depearing events can do a lot of damage to captives, and uh, the risk is for everybody. So I'd like to conclude by thanking my co-authors, Clint Hepner and Aline Popescu, and the image credit to Alberto Ferrero. I'll take questions at any time. Hello. Oh. Hey. Yeah. Um, Roque Ayana from Lagnik. Uh, when you got your, your chart by country, yeah. did you consider if the prefix that was missing was covered for a less specific? Because I was in, I mean, I got some feedback from all those South American companies. Here? Yeah. And I know many cases, and yeah, they might have, from the, for example, if you were a Spring customer in the Cogent side, you may not see one specific that they're using because of traffic engineering, but they do have a backup link through a, another transit for the less specific prefix that covers that more specific. Okay, so we did take a, we did take a look at that, um, but I can't actually answer your question very well, okay? <laughs> okay, I, because the problem that we saw in uh -huh. many of the ISPs yeah. was not inbound traffic, but outbound traffic. Yeah. So what was right. happening was that many ISP in the region, they don't do full routing. Yes. So they do just default load balancing for the outbound traffic. Okay. This, this so is that was the problem they were having. Not, not, not something that you can see in the, in the DFC, right. looking at Cogen and Sprint, but something that they realize that, do I really need to do full routing to solve this issue? Right. You know, and, and there are customers that are paying this, like, hey, solve your problems. Don't make me do full routing, but they started right. doing it. This is a very good point, and that's something that uh, uh, we, if, if it, this is not shown in BGP, we wouldn't necessarily see it. It's not shown in your view of BGP. Uh, okay, so in iBGP, well, this is, this is equivalent to somebody uh, default routing out, uh, say, Cogent, for example. So they're never going to advertise out Cogent, right? But they're default routing through Cogent. So they may, they may have a presence on another link. We can't see that. So, so that is a that is a, a, a possible. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, these guys are multi-homes to several providers, but they don't accept mo any other prefix from them than the default route. So, in anywhere in the route in, in the network, they're just low balance defaults. So, once every th you have three three option provider, one every three flows, I chose to take Sprint. But I don't care if it is a cogent destination. Uh, for it's just one in three. I don't know if it is the best AES path. I'm just doing default load balancing. So many times, that one of, so it happens that there's a chance that many of Cogent's destination, customer destination package will go through Sprint, even though there was no, Sprint has no route for it. Because I don't know, I'm not accepting their, their, their table. I'm just doing default. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hey, Anton Capella, Five Lines Data. Excellent presentation, Martin. Thanks, Tony. And uh, I was going to ask uh, if there's a way for us to see like a real-time sign-ups graph on market intelligence, <laughs> as you pointed out the fact that uh, could you go to that slide, please? A non-trivial number of prefixes from that, uh, yeah, from the top, whatever near the center, just are somehow not trying to resell someone else's access to the customer they already have. Uh, okay. That seems like a really bad position for a lot of people to be in. Yeah, I think it's. And, Yep. And one question I was going to ask you on this, um, you know, if you can't give me the sign up data, that's fine too. I just wanted to yeah. see how awesome this driver was. Um, there's a few hundred people watching this who could sign up right now. Um, 
Are you a paid yeah. shell? Is there <laughs> no. A, I'm not. I'm not paying him. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> All right. It, is there a question? And okay. So the question is: Did you look at the clustering by a number of ASs, not prefixes, or was that was that something? Uh, that? No. This is actually these suspected captives are just prefixes. Okay. So we didn't actually look. We didn't do an analysis of. AS level uh, single homedness. Well, so from the prefixes point of view, was this like 24s? You know, like an. Like oh, I see. A distribution. Yeah. Uh, was it like a single site have, with the. Have not, have yeah. not yet done an analysis of distribution. Uh, that would it, actually be a, a nice thing to add. Um, it seems like this is uh, okay. interesting to people, so maybe that's something we can do in the future. It definitely is. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Hi, Martin. Joe, uh, Joe Provo, ITA Software. Uh, excellent presentation. Thanks. Don't want to detract from it. That's like my favorite slide. <laughs> um, but I, I kept getting distracted by your terminology use because okay. DFZ, to, while I, I appreciate that you're avoiding tier one, okay. DFZ is, a, is, a, is, a, is an attribute of one's routing table, whether or not one is carrying a, a default, not okay. the economic relationships between you and other ASNs. Right. So, um, so there are plenty of uh, tier two and other entities that run without defaults okay. and control their traffic flow. Okay. Is there another term you'd put yeah, for Mr. Provo? Transit free. What's wrong transit, with that? Transit free. Okay. Transit free. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Patrick. Hi, Patrick Gilmore Akamai. Um, I was wondering what you did to uh, separate pe out people who have, say, a lot of peering and a single transit provider. Um, because there were at least there was at least one example of uh, somebody who was affected by the Sprint cogent depeering that you didn't list, where they had only one transit provider, Sprint. They have pretty wide peering, um, yeah. but they need Sprint to get to one or two other, you know, tier one transit free DFCs. I don't know whatever you want to call them. Sure. What, what's that, that ASN, Patrick? That one nine one five one. Thank you. Like you didn't know, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people here trying to have a broad, specific conversation. Good. I know. I was trying to avoid calling Randy out, but um, <laughs> so uh, what did you do to, um, or what could you do to p find those in the future since it was missing here? And I'm wondering, you know, if, uh, if you find that, um, I hesitate to call it a flaw, but there, there's a okay, bug in sure. the algorithm, what else could be missing or what else could be found? So in the, in the event that, say, uh, somebody who is not in the transit-free click but still peers with all of the Members of the transit free click? No, peers with many people, but not all. Okay. So has transit. Um, so for instance, what do you do to find a transit path? If you just see the AS or the prefix in your peering set um, from multiple places, that mean that you assign it as, uh, you know, not having transit or having a backup transit or something? Or are you looking, for instance, for two transit free ASs next to each other to prove that it has transit from okay, one of them? Yeah. Or what are you doing? Very good question. What we do is we actually build, uh, we build a model of uh, where we tag every single edge relationship between all ASNs. Mm -hmm. And so we use that in order to, uh, and the valley free, valley free property of routing to determine the path. Am I answering your question? Um, you are slightly. I mean, uh, how you okay. tag it is the important part here because something was missing. So this is probably not the right place to get into okay. it, but something was missing. I was wondering if there was you know, an obvious gotcha or a, a known okay. bug in the algorithm and then if we fixed it, what else we would we see? Okay, thanks. Uh, um, I may come ask you about that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you.